Hola, ¿qué tal? ¿Qué tal? Yo creo que nos conocimos una vez. Hace tiempo. Sí, hace, hace tiempo. Oye, you know that Friday is Cuban Independence Day, right? Friday is Cuban Independence Day. Just, you know, keep it in the back of your mind in case it comes up. 1902. Ladies and gentlemen, please uh, have your seats. Take your seats. Okay, thank you very much for coming. I appreciate the opportunity uh, to visit with all of you about an issue that uh, sh I think should get even more attention and, and more importantly, uh, smart, intelligent treatment uh, in the public policy debates here in Washington. I'm Roger Noriega. Uh, I'll be uh, sort of leading the co conversation with our guest, Antonio Rodiles, who really needs no introduction. Uh, because of his leadership in Cuba as one of the opposition leaders, well-respected, someone who's taken very serious risks uh, for principles and values that we all care about and which are in uh, dangerously short supply in Cuba today, uh, notwithstanding some of the misunderstandings uh, uh, about the Cuban reality uh, that's attended uh, this, the um, policy shift in the United States in the last uh, many months. Um, Antonio has uh, noticed that we've distributed here, um, says uh, is a uh, uh, coordinator of the Cuban Forum for Rights and Freedoms, uh, as well as for the citizen demand for different Cuba, la demanda ciudadana por otra Cuba y todo, todos marchamos, we all march, a citizen protest initiative. Uh, and we're honored to have him here. I'm not going to go on with any much of a, uh, introductory comments of my own because I think it's more important that we get to the discussion. And after he and I have an opportunity to have an initial exchange, uh, we'll throw it open to questions in about 30 minutes or so. So let me ask you all to silence uh, your emails. Oh, I'm sorry, your, uh, your uh, telephone machines. Uh, I'm, an, I'm, I'm kind of an old, I'm, a, I'm an old guy. Um, let me just say, I'm going to ask Antonio to sort of set the table for, for our audience. Many of you know Cuba pretty well. Some may not. I remember traveling to Cuba in 1998 during Pope John Paul II's uh, visit, and I heard two Eastern European diplomats uh, describe Cuba uh, as a Stalinist regime. One was, Euro one was Czech, one was Polish, and I figured they know what they were talking about. Uh, and I'm not sure that we understand here in this country what that means in 2016, a quarter century after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, how can the average uh, American understand what constitutes a totalitarian government? And when I see some of the neophytes uh, treating this, in, both in the media or in the White House, uh, I, I, I think of Jurassic Park, you know, where the archaeologists said, no, these are living animals and they're dinosaurs and they're deadly. Uh, but the neophytes insist on you know, taking a selfie with the velociraptor. And I think about that when I see uh, you know, Ben Rhodes leading this policy debate or President Obama getting his picture taken in front of Che Guevara mural. Uh, and it's, you, know, you just think of that, the dinosaur sort of devouring uh, the people there in the pith helmet, helmet trying to get their their uh, selfie with a, for, with a dinosaur. Um, so what is the nature of this totalitarian regime in, in Cuba today that you're coping with? And what are the everyday risks that you run uh, as an opposition figure in Cuba uh, just because you disagree with the government? Well, thank you. Thank you for the invitation to be here, all the people. Thank you, Roger, for to be here. Well, I'm going to ask one word to the description that you were doing. I'm going to put the word tropical. Because when you go to Cuba and you see the way that the regime is repressing all the opposition, the dissident, uh, anybody that speak out, they always are introducing a factor that probably you never see before in Europe or in other places. They introduce music, people dancing, they are introducing certain things that for the rest of the people that are not familiar 
with, with the uh, Q1 situation, they don't understand exactly what is happening. And this is something that we can see, especially in the last time, during the President Obama visit, the Sunday when he was arriving, they organized a, a repressing act against the opposition movement, and they took a group of people to dance after the repression. And many of the journalists that were there, they were really surprised because they didn't understand this kind of situation where you have a people trying to do a pacific manifestation, you have the secret police beating the protesters, and also after you, has pe you have people dancing with music. And then was, this, is, this is the kind of a scenario that sometimes we are facing in Cuba, and sometimes people from outside doesn't understand. I think that this is a, a, a really a difficult situation. Right now, the regime in some way feel more comfortable. They feel with more legitimacy. And now uh, our experience uh, say that they are more violent. They are beating more the, the, the people from the opposition, especially women. Uh, everybody knows, I think, that one of the leaders uh, group in the, in the Cuban opposition movement are the ladies in Hawaii. And they have been trying for a long time to use the public space also to go there and to talk and to make sometimes silence manifestation. And the regime have been repressing that group for a long time. You were mentioned in the introduction that we uh, are that I am in, in part of the uh, campaign. That the name is We All March, and the idea of that campaign is to retake the public space in Cuba. The government has like a slogan, and they say the street is for Fidel, or is from Fidel. La calle, esta calle es de Fidel. And what that means is that no people can go to the street to say what they think, to have any kind of public manifestation. And we are now focused to change that situation in, inside of the island. So sort of reclaim public space. Exactly. Uh, and so. One of the assumptions uh, behind President Obama's opening to Cuba is that the regime could be coaxed to open up, uh, at least economically, uh, if we build new partnerships and introduce new technology, for example. And one of the deals that he's licensed is to build 1940s era, era tractors with a company that's run by the Cuban military. So I don't really see the you know, aerating the system quite yet. Uh, the proposition is based on a narrative uh, that Raul Castro is a f frustrated reformer uh, and that Fidel is the hardliner in the regime. A recent Economist article painted a picture of Raul as a pragmatist, uh, a pragmatist who's managed to hold his tongue for 60 years uh, while his brother runs this uh, communist dictatorship. So that's the narrative. We, see, we saw the same thing here, and it's been well exposed uh, on Iran, where uh, Ronnie was uh, portrayed as their reformer, open to the West. He went after, and after his election, we could get serious about moving forward on Iran. And then it turned out that we actually started the negotiations under Ahmadinejad. So that's the narrative. Now the narrative is back to Cuba. Uh, Raul Castro, who's been a dictator uh, since uh, 2008 uh, and has been in control of the country's military for, for 60 years, uh, is some, somehow the frustrated reformer. So there are some supposed changes that have been advertised uh, by advocates of President Obama's opening, uh, some changes in you know, people being able to be self-employed and all that. What is the real context that Cuba is living in right now versus the image of what the media and what some apologists for President Obama's strategy uh, give the rest of us? What are, what's the reality in terms of the, you know, the, the, what you see on the ground from this new Raul regime and Raul era? Well, I think you have uh, in all of this kind of totalitarian, all of these totalitarian regimes, sometimes the strategy that different political actors play, and some of them try to show like they are the good policemen, and the others show that they are the bad policemen. And I think that that, that has been the, the reality in Cuba. Sometimes Raul is, a, is the good guy. Sometimes uh, Fidel is the, the good guy. 
And right now, they have been selling that, that idea that Raul is the, the person that is a pra pragmatic. He wants to produce certain change. But uh, Fidel and the, the people so that surround him don't allow that. I think that 10 years after, and I think we need to put in context, it's not one year, it's not two years, it's more than two presidential periods here in the US. It's 10 years after we see the same nature of the regime. They are really violent. They don't want to allow to people to, to get rich, they say openly. They have been telling clearly, we are not going to move even one millimeter. And sometimes people say, no, they are only telling that, but at the end they are going to move. No, 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 they are, they are honest. Mm -hmm. And they show that they are honest in that sense. They don't want to move, and they don't move. And I think that what we have uh, here, if we, in some way, we want to understand quickly, which is the logic of the regime, we need to understand that they are moving in the direction to have a kind of tropical dynasty. And the person that is now receiving most of the power is the son of Raul Castro. You, you can see in, during the speech of the President Obama in, in the theater in Havana that you have in that balcony, you have three generations of Castros. You have Raul Castro, the son of Raul Castro, and the grandson of Raul Castro. Then if we want to be objective, we need to realize that they are working really hard, and right now they are doing well to try to success this transition to, uh, to his son. And I like to say that they are trying to create an illusion. They want to say, we are going to do certain steps in 2018 and after leader by leader. And what they are doing is the, 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 the classical trick that they are showing something here, but they are doing back all the transfer of power. Did you see what, what is happening now, for example, in the military? They are removing all the people that are over 60 and 65 years. That is happening also in the Communist Party. That was one of the results of the, uh, the, the, the Communist Party meeting that finished a few weeks ago. They, they have different times. They say, well, we are going to remove certain people now in 2016. The next ex ex step, step is going to be in 2018. And the final step is going to be in 2021. Then they have the plan. And what they are doing is to try to gain time. And they are selling the idea or the fantasy that they are going to do certain steps. But what they are doing is concrete steps to transfer the power to their family and to their political allies. I think if we want to understand what happened in the Communist Party, if we want to understand the signal that they sent to the, during the President Obama visit, if we, we want to understand what they are doing, we need to focus in the dynasty construction that they are doing. Oh, I mean, I think that's really interesting because the president, uh, you know, and I am not going to question his uh, good faith. I do question his judgment. But I think he believed that uh, he st could sort of, if he created some space, uh, reduce the level of hostility, take that historic measure to, to go there, legitimize them uh, with the political recognition, uh, that it would, you know, generate some space to sort of people Raul to get in touch with his inner reformer. Uh, and then you see the dynastic transition and the president of the United States licensing transactions with military entities um, that are essentially operated by the Castro family. So on the contrary, rather than moving to where you're kind of opening up possibilities of transition, they're actually going with Raul Castro's plan A, which is passing power uh, within the family. A dynastic regime here, we, here we are in the, in the well into the 20th, 21st century. Let's turn a second to President uh, Obama's personal engagement uh, in this opening to the Castro regime. We all saw the clumsy news conference at the end of their meetings in, in which President Obama seemed genuinely uh, irritated by uh, Raul, the, the generalissimo, uh, uh, and um, you were part of the group of dissidents that met with President Obama in Havana. Tell me a little bit about what you told him. How was how was he receiving this? Did you find what he said 
you know, particularly compelling or convincing? Uh, did, he, did he seem open to your comments, or was he sort of uh, just going through the motions? Well, I believe that the President Obama wants to provoke a kind of positive change in Cuba, but we need to be realistic. We need to be pragmatic. And in the scenario that we are facing, uh, even the law that is ruling in Cuba doesn't allow that uh, steps. Um, the violation of the human rights in Cuba is part of the law. And this is something crucial to understand. This is not because a, a person is violating the, 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 my rights or an institution uh, is violating my rights. No, it's part of the law. It's part of the structure of the law in Cuba. Then all the package that President Obama was announcing, announcing in 2014, in December, not any of that uh, measures can put in, in place because the law doesn't allow that. Then I think that this is something important to understand. And also then, in that context, the people that are taking advantage of that steps are uh, the military, are the NGOs from the government. Then they, they have been creating a kind of fake civil society. Mm. And all of these people are taking advantage of all of the new policy. Then we need to understand that there is a huge difference to deal with uh, uh, certain regimes where you don't have, uh, you have lack of freedoms or like that, or you are dealing with a totalitarian regime. They have the whole control. And they can do whatever they want because they are completely uh, over the state uh, platform. Then in, the, in relation with the visit of the President Obama, uh, fortunately, I think that the visit was, uh, had a good result. Honestly, I think one of the uh, situation that provoked that the, 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 the visit was, had a, a good result was the pushing from the opposition movement. They, the Cuban government never before need to face a, a group of uh, oppositors uh, going to the street, articulated to do this kind of uh, protest. And they, they, f they react in the way that o uh, only, oh, sorry, always they react. They were violent. And they, send, uh, they want to send a signal that they are not going to uh, allow us to do anything. But at the same time, they did be in front of all the foreign press. And I think that that created an environment for the rest of the visit, because they were really, really aggressive. And everybody was surprised uh, with uh, the reaction that they had. Then during the visit, uh, I think that the, the violation, the, the violence from the government continued during the whole time. And even we need to call to the embassy to tell them, please, you need to send a car to take us to the meeting, because if no, probably we are not going to arrive. They are going to arrest us in, the, in our way. I think, honestly, it was, a, was a, a good meeting. It was like almost two hours. The situation was different. The scenario was different in relation with the previous uh, visit of Secretary of State, uh, State John Kerry. Some of my colleagues decided to don't go to that meeting because we didn't understand that the uh, American government accept the condition from the regime. And they didn't invite us to the official uh, reopening of the embassy. But in that case, the situation was di different. We received an invitation. The meeting was in the, in the schedule, the official schedule. And I think that was a, a good opportunity to tell directly to the President Obama what we think about the situation that we are facing. And my main message was, Mr. President, you and the United States need to decide who are your friends. The people that are pushing and facing the Cuban regime, we are the friends of US, of, of the, the democracy world, and we are taking the risk for that. And we need the support of you. And we need a clear message also to the Cuban regime. We have been telling from the beginning that we agree with the political process as a way to resolve the Cuban dilemma. We think that the, the, the best way to resolve that situation is a, is a political process. But we need a real political process. And no a kind of situation where the government is taking more advantage. And the Cuban people, and even the US, 
is not receiving what we need. And I think this is something that many people are complaining. Inside of the position, that there is a, a huge group. And we, we have a platform that the name is the Forum for the Right and Freedoms. And we have a, 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 a roadmap where we are asking, if we want to resume what we are asking, is the implementation of the UN Human Rights Covenant. It's something simple. They signed that uh, covenant in 2008, but they don't want to ratify that covenant. And why? Because they need to change then the internal law. And then, then they need to dismantle the, totalia, the totalitarian regime from inside. And they don't want that. Then I think that here we are in front of a clear dilemma, is who are the people that is going to benefit from this new political process? Mm -hmm. And that, I think, need to be completely clear, not only in signal, if not in actions, too. Absolutely. And I think that's extraordinarily important that we continue to hold uh, the administration, keep this dialogue open, because I found the president's speech that he gave in Havana very powerful in certain ways, uh, and a very eloquent defense and appeal and reminding Cubans that they uh, that they have a basic right to human dignity and decide their own future. I think, and it, it it and I was pleased with that statement. I uh, and I assume Cubans were too. Tell me a little bit about their reaction to his message to that address particularly. Um, and also, give me an idea of, do you think that Cubans will ever test the ability of the system to keep them under control? I have this impression of the regime in certain ways. I mean, very, very you know, violent and, and, and efficient in, in dispensing that violence to control the people, but also sort of this kind of a brittle model, this whole, certainly delegitimized in terms of humanity. So do you think that the president might eventually be credited with raising expectations so much that it will move Cubans to act uh, in a way that the regime can't control? Well, first, in relation with the speech, I think that was a really good speech. Of course, when we are inside of this uh, political scenario and these political dynamics, we always expect more. And sometimes I was expecting from the president to talk directly about the opposition movement and the repression directly against women and like that. But even though I think that the reaction of the people was good, they listened for the first time during m almost 60 years, a, a person talking openly about what means the, the, the freedom of the human being. He talked about Miami, and I think that People like to listen to all of this kind of thing. In fact, probably here, you didn't see, probably the press didn't show that, I don't know. But around the, the theater was like three or four places where you have the confrontation from citizens with the police. Because some people start to protest. They repress the person. After, another person start to complain. That happened in like three or four focus around the, the theater. I think that after the, the speech, uh, during some time, people were talking a lot about what they were listening, especially the situation that the, he was remarking um, uh, about that the, the people that are the responsible of the situation, the economic situation, are, uh, are the Cuban regime. He said, well, I think even if we uh, finish with embargo, the situation is not going to change too much because you need to change certain things. Uh, everybody listened to that point. And I think that that was important. The, the situation was that after the visit, they uh, tried to do something similar uh, that they did in when the John Paul II uh, uh, visited Cuba. They were trying to, I don't know how to say English, uh, encapsulate. <laughs> The sort of capture exactly to to close to to create like a kind of bubble, no? Okay. Uh, around the, the the visit, no. And then they they well they start to talk about the Communist Congress Party, and they a lot of articles start to to attack the president position. 
Well, they, they were like in a block against uh, the, what happened during the visit. Even though I think that the message is there, and we can see um, after uh, a year that we have been working, also distributing a lot of information, going to the street, organize a protest, the speech, and after, and I think that uh, it, it is a strange probably to understand, but I think that the Communist Party was good for us, for the opposition movement, because they were so clear, and the message was so clear. Mm -hmm. And then when you have all of these uh, elements, the result that we have right now is that in Cuba, you have more people ready to manifest, ready to protest. And I think that this is a, a really good signal. Even I, the Chanel Parade, can I say that in English? Mm -hmm. el, el desfile de, 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 de Chanel. Oh, yes, the, uh, remember that uh, model fashion show? Yeah, I think that Chanel. That was great for us. To, mm -hmm. Because this is something like a irrational to understand. You have a, like a small place where you have people with, with fashion and glamour and everything, and you have few meters people living in completely a miserable, miserable condition. And this is completely opposed to the speech that the regime have had during all these years. But the good point here is that the Castro's family was there too. Mm. Then how people are receiving all this signal, how people are receiving this situation, and I think that this is a good opportunity also for the opposition movement to show that there is no possible solution in Cuba if these people keep in power. And I think that this is something crucial for me and for many people that are uh, we are working together to show to the whole international community, to show to the Cuban people, to show to everybody that if the Castro family is there, nothing is going to change. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is no something new for totalitarian regimes. There are many countries where we have that certain group of people have the monopoly of the power. And if you, if you don't remove these people from there, nothing is going to change. And corruption, for example. Corruption is something completely tied to this uh, family and to this regime. And if we want a, a, a positive change in Cuba, we need to remove all of this element. If not, we are going to have a mess, even worse that that the situation that we are living right now. That's, uh, that's very profound. And again, I would hasten to add, it's really important to continue to discuss these things while President Obama is still in office, because he has placed a bet uh, that uh, this opening would bring about change. I frankly, I hope he's right. I don't think he will be proven correct, but, but I hope uh, that, that he's right. Um, it's interesting that some of the multinationals and companies that wanted to do business in Cuba that were agitating for the change in U.S. policy, uh, I'm now hearing from a lot of them, there's no opportunity in, in, in Cuba. They've, they've gone, they've been taken on their uh, snipe hunts on the island and uh, looking for business and the people, the interlocutors that they talk with are, you know, these government bureaucrats who have no position or no position to sort of make deals or make decisions on, on their own. And they're seeing the system that really the opportunity is not there. So it's already lost momentum. But I, again, I don't question the president's uh, good intentions. And I hope that he is more rigorous uh, as he leaves office when he sees that the system is absolutely not going to change. I also hope that the Cuban people test their own government. Uh, I mean, I, I saw a video, I'm sure you've seen it, of, of a woman who said something against the regime, and so they descend on her and push her into a, uh, into a co police car, and some people intervened and just took her very gently, went, pushed the police aside, took her by the arm and took her out of the police car. You know, if, and I've heard from other people that that's happening more and more. Yeah. It's really <laughs> very interesting. Um, so, but let's go back to this proposition that these economic openings that, you know, letting tourists go and, 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 and uh, investments and all these things that, 
the Cuentapopistas, the people who are self-employed, that this will gradually open up political space and, and, and all that. What, what are your thoughts on that? Is that I mean, an efficient, effective way to bring about political change is this economic empowerment? I don't think that we can uh, split the freedom in different aspects. I think that if you have the freedom to express yourself, if you have the freedom of association, if you have the, f the economic freedoms too, this is the only way to construct a different society. I don't think that we can split right now where is finishing the economic freedom and where uh, start the civic and political freedom and, and rights. Uh, on, on another hand, I think that the Cuban regime is completely uh, sending a clear message that they are not going to allow any kind of political um, economic freedom for the Cuban people. They say that explicitly in the Communist Party uh, meeting. And they, they, in the way that they uh, construct the, the new a scenario for the entrepreneurs, the so-called cuentapropistas, it is clear that they are not going to allow that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put just one example. If you see the tax system that is operating in Cuba right now, well, they have a, a progressive uh, system that after $2,000 per year, $2,000 per year, you need to pay 50% of your income. Who can pay that? Mm. Then, at the same time, and, and this is to uh, exemplify how is corruption working, you have, for example, the price of utilities. Pe some people that have a, a, a good restaurant, they need to pay per month 90,000 uh, Cuban pesos for the electricity. But if you need to pay after 50,000, you need to pay 50%. And in, in one month, you are consuming 90,000. How, how you can explain that? Mm -hmm. Everything in Cuba now is related with corruption. And what we are building now in this, with this logic of about cuenta propistas and small businesses and all of this kind of thing, is a, is a network of corruption. Mm -hmm completely related with the power. Mm -hmm. It's a loyal group of people to the regime that knows perfectly that if they, in some moment, start to take position different than the one the regime wants, you are done. And what percentage of the contrapropistas themselves are sort of retirees from the military or from the regime itself? Well, most of the people that have good restaurant and another kind of business are related with the Cuban government. In some way, one way or another, they are related. Mm -hmm. And they need to do that because if not, they don't have the connections. And again, this is not something new for this kind of totalitarian regimes. See what was happening in Russia and in other countries, and then we realize which is the way that can take, or the path that can take this proposal that we are receiving now as a society. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think that the idea to empowerment the people is a, for sure a good idea. But need, need, we, we need to have the tools to do that in practice. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is the good point here. The American government has the, the, the power, has the possibility to, to push in order that the regime implement a change of the law in order that people can get empowerment. And I think that this is the, the goal right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we have the, the, the both government or the, the American government and the Cuban regime restablish the relation. Okay, What's, uh, what is next? What we need to do now in order that this new policy or need new, this new political process really help to the Cuban people. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is not a, a message not only for the actual administration, also for the future president or in the US. What we are going to do, what kind of Cuba we have for the future. Mm -hmm. How Cuba can affect the region and also US in the future if we don't have, a, 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 we are not constructing a real rule of law or a real democracy in Cuba. Precisely. And I think that this is something 
crucial now to understand in what direction we are going to move. Mm -hmm. I think there, that's exactly right. And the reason you can't separate economic rights and, and political freedoms is because the pillar underneath both of them is the rule of law. And if you don't have the rule of law, you're, you're not going to be able to build an economy of any size or, or sustainability. Uh, and um, so this, this is the real challenge. I, I got a, an email from a Cuban-American who was afraid that I was going to be very hard line against uh, the president's policies. Uh, and he said, be, in, in his opinion, was if a Cuban is asked between, to choose between whether they have political freedom or have an economic opportunity to feed their families, they're going to choose economic freedom. The injustice is that Cubans are forced to make that decision. And until the president came along, uh, the, we're talking about a regime that's made, a, a, made it a binary choice. You either engage the Cuban regime or you engage the Cuban people. You cannot really do both. And until President Obama came along, presidents decided to, 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 to not engage the regime and different levels of intensity and creativity those presidents tried to help the Cuban people. And that's, I, I hope, again, where I think President Obama's administration will come around uh, at, at the end. One final thing about, and this is where we get a lot of attention, is the tourism. Because, uh, you know, it's not supposed to be tourism. They're, they're now talking in Capitol Hill about lifting the travel ban. The fact is hundreds of thousands of Americans travel to Cuba uh, every year in different categories. It's supposed to be so, sort of purposeful travel, cultural education, scientific, religious, that sort of thing. Now, it, without the, any kind of specific licensing, I think you're going to see you know, rum tours and marina tours and, and, and just you know, uh, tourists filling up hotels that are owned by the, by the military. I mean, most people don't know that the Cuban military controls more hotel rooms than Disney. Uh, it's one of the biggest uh, tourism companies in, the La in Latin America. It's run by the Cuban military. But I actually encourage Cubans to go. To, I, mean, I mean, I, I encourage people to go to Cuba. Uh, if, if they go with certain purposes and, wanna, and have a, a, a really want to sort of understand what's happening in that economy. Um, you know, when I see Kim Kardashian there and Chanel, you know, there's never a velociraptor around when you need one. But, but um, <laughs> uh, you know, that's kind of disgusting. But, but I think it's good to have this kind of contact, people-to-people uh, -people contact. How does the regime go about sort of controlling that? What are your thoughts on general about uh, 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 Americans visiting? You know, three million Canadians and Europeans visit every year and hasn't brought about any political change. But... What are your thoughts about that issue and how the regime, how does the regime restrict what tourists are able to do? Well, in the 90s, um, they, the situation was different. After the Soviet Union collapsed, the Cuban regime didn't have uh, the structure to control tourists. Then many people used to go to, to houses to rent. To, they used to have a, a private taxis to move in the city. Uh, they visit uh, private restaurants. But right now, the situation is a little bit different because all of the, the uh, tourists that are arriving uh, to the country, most of them uh, go uh, usando, uh, using uh, pa tourist package. Can I say it like that? Yes. Then the people that are controlling that inside of Cuba, again, are... Uh, 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 companies that are related with the army, then most of the most of the time they are moving in buses through the cities. They take these people sometimes to paladars, but the paladars are or restaurants. They are the one that are related with the uh, people from the elite. They take after they finish, they take to another place that and like that they never had a real contact mm -hmm. with the people. Right, and this is a little bit different. I have been. Uh, talking with a lot of taxi drivers, and I have been asking how is going the business. They say, "Well, it's not the same like before, because in the nineties we used to move more people, and now they are moving all the time in the buses." Mm. Then it is clear that now the Cuban regime is more prepared 
to control the contact with the people than before. And I think mm -hmm. for sure if you if we are talking about people to people contact and policy, I think that could be a good policy if it's working in the way that it is supposed that it's working. Mm -hmm. I can say that from our experience since uh, 2014, there is not even one group, one, that have been sitting us in our independent project. That was different than before. Interesting. Before, sometimes, groups for, from universities used to go to our space to have a talk like this one, and we were talking about the Cuban reality. But I don't know why. And it is supposed that now uh, we we will see an increase. Now there is no even one group that have been visiting us. Then the contact with embassy, not just with the American embassy. In the last time, they approached a little bit in relation also with the uh, Obama visits. But all the embassies, the Spain embassy, uh, Poland embassy, all the European embassy, they have less contact with us. And we are asking why. It is supposed that the new policy is addressed in the, uh, to empowerment, to empower the people. Mm -hmm. What is happening right now? Uh, it's a remarkable. It's a remarkable. I, I, quite frankly, I suspected that. I'm going to throw this open to, to questions. Uh, you know, I remember when I was when I traveled uh, to Cuba with a uh, person who now works for Senator Corker and Mark Thiessen who works for AEI. Uh, we know we were tailed, but we went during the pres Pope's visit, and they're really we were preoccupied with other things other than following us. But then, nevertheless, they did follow us around, and it was interesting to you know st starting conversations with Cubans, go ending in up in their homes talking with their families uh, about the reality and you, building this level of trust over a period of time, it, it's really interesting uh, the candor that comes out about what the problem is. They all know what the problem is. It isn't the bloqueo, it's the system. Uh, and um, so I hope Am Americans have that opportunity, quite frankly, to do that. But, um, you know, I don't think sunbathers are going to liberate Cuba. And uh, I think people need to take it a little more seriously have their, so they can leave with a clear conscience when, when they go to Cuba. So raise your hand if you'd like. Uh, please uh, identify yourself. I'm going to go one, two, three. Identify yourself and uh, form your question in the form of a question. All right, hello, my name is Olivia de la Pena. I am a student journalist. And one thing that I've been curious about is trying to get millennials and young people interested in talking about Cuba. Because I've, especially within on my college campus, a lot of kids are in ardent support of Bernie Sanders. And back in, I believe it was the 80s, Bernie Sanders praised Castro for establishing health care and free education in Cuba. Now, what would be your reaction to those people who are saying, well, Castro did some good things to Cuba, and the fact that he established the system, while at the same time the system is subpar, how would you make the argument that, that in a sense, that same policy should not be applied to the U.S.? Well, the point is that if you visit Cuba, you are going to realize that the public system is completely destroyed. And you have the health care is not working. The schools, most of the professors are leaving the country. All my generation, I study physics. Uh, and I am a physicist. Uh, uh, and most of my friends are outside of the country. The universities are almost empty. And the same happened, the same situation you have in the in hospital. You have uh, all physicians, two young physicians, but you don't have people in the middle. And when you see the, the situation that we are facing over there, it's a critical situation in everything. There is a kind of myth that people are repeating that this, the health system in Cuba is good, but you just need to visit the hospitals in Cuba. I think most of that hospital in everywhere will be closed. And uh, I think that they, unfortunately, there is a lot of propaganda about that situation. And both the, the health system in Cuba and the education system also 
is in a really, really bad condition. I think that this is, uh, unfortunately, some people have a different uh, um, vision, but the reality is is not that. So those are the people that should visit Cuba and see what's happening. Sir. Hi, Roger Betancourt, University of Maryland. Uh, my question is about migration. What is the relationship that you see between the economic circumstances, people in your age bracket, as you were pointing out, have a strong incentive to migrate, and the Cuban Adjustment Act. The Cuban government seems to be trying to get the US government to repeal it uh, for arguing that it provides an incentive for migration. A lot of people feel the incentives is the lack of opportunity in Cuba. What is your position with respect to both people who are trying to migrate and the Cuba Adjustment Act incentivizing them to do so? Well, I think that there are different factors that are in, uh, has influence in what is happening with immigration. And, I, and this is a question that always appears when we talk about Cuba. And one person from the uh, uh, State Department once asked me, why do you think that people are leaving the country right now if it is supposed that there are uh, now certain level of optimism about what is going to happen? And I repeat to him a, a joke, a joke, mm -hmm. Chiste, no? yes. a joke mm -hmm. that many people know in Cuba. And the situation is that Fidel Castro called Pepito, and this is the guy that always is doing things that anybody expect. No? Fidel Castro called Pepito and said, Pepito, we have a big problem. Everybody's leaving Cuba. Nobody wants to return. Let's think what to do. I want that you go to Miami and talk to the people and see how you can bring back the people. Well, Pepito go to Miami. Three weeks ago, he appeared with a lot of airplanes full of Cubans. And he go to see Fidel Castro, and Fidel Castro asked to him, Pepito, what did you do that everybody's coming? And Pepito said, too simple, my uh, commander. I told to them that you and your brother are going to move to Miami, <laughs> and all the people return. <laughs> and then I used to say that one of the point of this new policy is then send the signal that the Castros are going to be there. And then the normal reaction of the people was, if the Castro are, are going to be here, we need to leave. And of course, they know that the Cuban adjustment can change also, because now there, there are normal relations. And then there is no uh, exactly justification for that. Then I think the combination of all of this, and also the critical economic situation that we have, are the fact that are pushing a lot of Cubans now to leave the country. And I think that this is so important because always the Cuban regime have been selling the idea that they represent stability. And there are a lot of people that have been selling the idea that they, the, the American government need to negotiate with the Cuban regime because they, they, they are the only uh, group that can government, govern the country. They have been selling that idea. But what we see in the reality is that the situation is the contrary. They are now in power. They send the, the message that they are going to be there for a while. And then the reaction of the people is, we need to escape. And even inside of the country, and let's see what is going to happen, now people are feeling more frustrated than ever. Then I don't think that is a good idea to sell that product. I think it's better to understand that the in the opposition movement, in the Cuban civil society, are the ones that can really rule the country for better for the Cubans and for the, all the, the whole region and for the United States. No? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, I think uh, stability is overrated, uh, in my personal <laughs> opinion. And, and if Lech Valenza can run Poland, uh, I'll, I'll take any Cuban out of the phone book when they used to have phone books. <laughs> I'm Jaime Aparicio, I'm former ambassador of Bolivia. And, uh, well, we thank you very much for this great update on Cuba. We are seeing some change in Latin America, important changes in the biggest countries. And my question is, how do you see uh, an implosion of Venezuela would affect Cuba 
at least from the point of view of the people that it's in the opposition of the people in the streets. I think that the, 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 what is happening in Venezuela is crucial for Cuba, and also what happened in Brazil. I think that the but Brazil situation, uh, the situation in Brazil, the, the Cuban regime didn't expect that that happened that quickly. And uh, we cannot uh, forget that Brazil is the the first investor in the Mariel port. And now that uh, plan, that economic plan is stopped because they don't have uh, any people that go there and put the money. And, and Lula da Silva was the the sponsor of that project too, project too. Then I think that the combination of what is happening in Venezuela and in Brazil is creating a difficult, a really difficult scenario for the regime. And for sure, they need to move forward with the relation with the US. But at the same time, they are too afraid. They are too afraid to lose the control. And then that's why I think that we are now from the opposition in a good situation. I think that this is a, a time to work really hard and to look for more allies and to show that we can be a power uh, option for the future. We are working in that. We are trying to send all the signal that we can send to the Cuban society. We are working really hard to distribute information uh, because one of the things is that the Cuban government have the whole control of circulation of information in Cuba. And we are working hard in that. But I think that it is, this is a special moment to take space inside of Cuba. And we are working really hard in that. Absolutely. Other questions in Enrique and this gentleman? Uh, my name is Enrique Perez. I'm a retired US government employee. And uh, my question has to do with the role of the different churches in Cuba. The Catholic Church after the Pope's visit, the evangelical churches. You said that you had little contact now with some of the embassies than you did before. What about with the Catholic Church and with the other churches? Are they approaching you? Have they remained distant? And what could they do for the situation of human rights in Cuba in the future? Well, I'm going to talk about the, the Catholic Church first. I think that, unfortunately, and this is not a secret for anybody, uh, when Cardinal Ortega uh, was as the Arzobispo of Havana, he was several times talking against the Cuban opposition movement. This is not a secret for anybody. But this is not the same situation for another uh, uh, obispos. I don't know how to say in English. Archbishops. Yeah, bishops. And we have had contact with them, some of them. We have been talking about the situation that we are facing, about the human rights violation, about our interest to have more contact with the Catholic Church. And we have had uh, good reactions. Let's see now that the, the uh, Ortega is no more as the Arzobispo of Havana. And, and we, our idea is to reestablish the contact with them and to see what can happen uh, in that. I think that the, the, the role of the Catholic Church in Cuba is going to be fundamental because uh, they are the only institution that is all around the country. And they have a, a, there are many people uh, working and around the Catholic Church. I, th I, I think that they need to play an important role. I hope that they assume that. And, and now, with the new change that is inside of the church, they can uh, play a positive role in the situation that we are facing. In relation with the other churches in Cuba, well, there are different groups. There are some of them that are too related with the government, following exactly the same line. But there are other people that know. There are other churches that they are not following the same uh, line that the government is uh, pointing. Uh, even in the last time, there is a repression against certain uh, Protestant, Protestant, how do you say? Protesters. Protestant uh, churches. And oh, I'm sorry, Protestants. Protestants. Sorry. Protestant. Protestants. Protestant churches. And then let's see what is going to happen. But we, we, in general, we are positive about what is happening right now. Because uh, people, most of the people want to move forward. Most of the people are too tired. And the regime is not giving any option to anybody. Then I think that. If we, uh, as the opposition movement, start 
uh, we, we push uh, and, and we show to the rest of the Cuban society that we need to ask for our rights. And we can be more articulated. I think that this is going to have an impact in the rest of the society too. And also we, we are going to have a kind of feedback because most of the people now are also uh, trying to get in contact with us. I, in the last time, some people working inside of the university have been making contact with us, asking uh, because they have problems inside of the university, what they can do, how we can help them. Mm -hmm. Then I think that they, there is a, a good uh, climate uh, or weather, no? Climate. Climate, sorry. That's perfect. Yeah. And, and I think that we need to, to take advantage of that. If it, this is a good moment, and uh, we need to, to take advantage of that situation and to push. I mean, I'm one who thinks that the U.S. Embassy and all these embassies should be sort of empowering and, and, and engaging. It's a shame to me, I think, that, that they're pulling back. And, and one of the messages I've heard from other dissidents is that the Cuban regime is saying to them, you guys don't matter. Yeah. Uh, you don't matter, you lost, because you lost the United States as an advocate. And so... You know, I hate to think that the only reason the European embassies were engaging you is because the Americans were always insisting. Uh, you know, Kirsten Madison was in the Bush administration. She, the Europeans saw her coming. They went the other direction because she went after them about, why don't you engage more on, on Cuba? Uh, and then you saw Francis travel to meet the Greek metropolitan within days of the regime tearing down Protestant churches. Not a word. You know, so these things are demoralizing. On the other hand, to the extent Cubans are getting more active, filling that space, taking full advantage, that's a positive thing. I just think that you know, you know, outsiders should care about these things, should care about these injustices and do what they can to help. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. There was a, uh, that famous uh, Frenchman who said uh, that uh, the despotic regimes are in their greatest danger when they begin to reform themselves. And uh, would you agree that uh, the opening to China, I mean, it, it did happen in China too, uh, the opening there created a, a fundamental change in the dynamic. The next day after Kissinger left, after his first visit in 1971, Ben Bial fled the country. Uh, the, the closest comrade to Mao Zedong showed that there was this incredible division within the country. And it was over the question of uh, one of the things that brought it to a peak, and then Bial fleeing and dying in a plane crash, was uh, the question about relations with the United States and, and the Soviet Union. But it also, the, the, after Mao went, we saw again the great change. The moderates came, at least the pragmatists came to power, uh, Deng Xiaoping, and uh, they have brought about fundamental change in China that almost inconceivable uh, when I was there in, uh, in the 1970s. And uh, it's unpredictable. But they had certain factors at work uh, that sped it along in Cuba and, and China, including uh, money investments coming from overseas Chinese and then the United States. But uh, Cuba has, would you agree, I think, a, an amazing element in this uh, dynamic. And that is uh, the Cuban-American a yeah. population in the United States, yes. and uh, the connections, the ties, and as investments uh, expand in Cuba, uh, they sell more and more government enterprises, the Cuban-American community is going to play an incredible role in this. And I think within 20 years, you, China, Cuba will not be able, like China, to separate, as you say, economic growth from uh, political control. Well, I think that the, that's why the Cuban regime doesn't want Cubans to be investing in Cuba. They don't want even the people, the Cubans that are like, like me, that we are inside, they don't want us to do absolutely anything inside. They, they, they just want people completely far from for the, the, the Cubans in order to try to, to keep the control. But I think that uh, there is something that they cannot uh, avoid, and they cannot avoid the pressure that we are doing from inside. And I, I think this is the key point here in the transformation. I don't want to think that little by little and in 20 years, the regime is going to change. I don't want that. 
I don't have time for that. And there are a lot of people that doesn't have time for that. We want the change right now. And we are pushing for that. And in fact, we, are, we, we see results. If we talk about one year ago, two years ago, nobody can speak out in the street without being arrested and beaten by the police, and nobody react when they see that situation. And if you see what is happening right now, this is completely different. People are reacting. Of course, there is not the numbers that we need and we want, but at least we have the initial point for that. And we think that we cannot lose the opportunity. Because I, I, I like to make a comparison with the 400, I don't know how to say, 400 metros, uh, 4 metros planos in, in, in La Carrera. Exactly. Four, uh, well, exactly. Four by one. You have a critical moment. And it's when one guy passed to the other the baton. If they can do all the pass, probably they are not going to arrive in the first place, in the second, the third, but they are going to arrive. But if they lost the baton, they lost their career. And I think that we are now in that point. They are passing the baton. And then if we don't allow that, then we can win. And also, that's why they are creating an illusion that the change is going to be in 2018, 2021. I don't know. No, no, no. We cannot buy that product. We need to say the change need to be now. And probably it's not going to be in one week, two weeks, three months, four months. But our goal is the profound change of the country. And that's why I think we need to focus in that. I mean, how many years did China have the economic, in the economic opening, per se, before they ran tanks over people in Tiananmen Square? And, and do we, huh? Ten, ten years. Yeah. I mean, they, they were, I mean, we, we have to do better. Okay, 69. So 20 years after the opening to China, they ran tanks over people in Tiananmen Square. So we got... We got to hopefully we'll do a little bit better than that with our for our friends in Cuba. Uh, but I, I got to tell you, what, I'm going to go to the another question. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'll tell you what. What, what were you going to say? I think you agree with everything you said. Yes, I agree with everything you said. That the change is uh, going to come hopefully much sooner, and we all should push for it, and not go around making that our slogan. Is that okay? In 20 years, is all right. <laughs> Uh, as soon as possible, but within 20 years. That sure. won't be our slogan, though. Sure. Sorry, I didn't mean I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead, please. Uh, thanks, thanks, Roger. Uh, thank you, Antonio. Uh, my name is Jose Cardenas. I'm a consultant here in Washington. Antonio, uh, President Obama has about uh, less than a year left in office. There will be a new president elected, U.S. president elected in November. If you uh, could make recommendations on how uh, U.S. policy should be recast or amended, altered, reformed uh, for the next U.S. president, the next U.S. administration's policy towards Cuba, what would you recommend? Well, I think that one crucial point is to stop re the repression in Cuba. I think that the American government need to tell to the Cuban regime you need to stop the repression. The second point that I see that could be really important is to ask to the regime to ratify the UN Human Rights Covenant. Because this is a direct way to ask to the Cuban regime, change your law. Without the justification from the government to say that they are intervening in the internal issues. Because the Cuban government was talking all the time about the UN chart for the restablish the relation with the UN gov uh, US government. And they say, well, we need to use that as a pattern to see how it's going to behave your embassy and my embassy and all this kind of thing. And why they don't want to accept to ratify the UN human rights covenants. Because the situation, and there is a really interesting article from a guy from the official point of view and he explained in the article why the Cuban regime cannot ratify the UN Human Rights Covenant. 
and he explained in the article that if they start to implement that covenant, they are going to dismantle the system. I don't know if the article is in favor of is against, but the guy explained clearly how the ratification and implementation of that covenant is going to dismantle the totalitarian regime. And I think that this is one point that is critical too. And the other point is the clear recognition of the opposition movement in Cuba. I think that three, these three points can make a huge difference for the future. Hmm. Hopefully we'll have a president that's willing to do that. Uh, we'll go right here and then the lady in the back. Yeah. My name is uh, Juan Butari. I am an economist, formerly was at USA. Uh, I wanted to pick on uh, a comment made by Ambassador Noriega on the effectiveness of assistance to potential civil society institutions under the rubric of uh, democracy, promoting democracy. And the question is, do you have a sense of how effective, effective that type of assistance has been in the past? As uh, the ambassador said, apparently it is gradually being decreased. So I, I, I wanted to get a sense of how effective, if, if any, has that assistance been in the past, and what type of assistance uh, not only the US but other democracies could provide to the opposition movement in Cuba? Well, I think that that uh, assistance is fundamental because the Cuban government controls everything in the island. Then if we don't have that assistance, how to work? And we need, in order to, to develop what we are doing, we need to, to, to have that, that assistance. We need to have funds to work. But at the same time, as you say, there are a lot of uh, criticism about the assistant, how to use that. And But I think that now, if we have this new scenario, that some people can go there and see in the ground how things are working, I think that can make a difference. I think the new scenario can help for the people that are working with Cuba, with the NGOs that are working in Cuba. Then they can find a way to go there and see in the ground how the people that are, they are working together, how they behave, how effective they are. And I think that now this is a, a good possibility. The other question was, uh, sorry. Yes, sir. OK, sorry. thank you. Uh, the lady in the back there. Hello, my name is Stephanie Ruiz. I'm from NDI. Um, I wanted to ask you a twofold question. You had mentioned the importance of the rule of law um, and kind of changing the framework um, away from the communist rule of law into something that is uh, recognizant of the will of the people. Um, can you tell me a little bit if you know anything about the electoral reform that has been uh, propositioned within the Communist Party? Um, if there are any working groups, do you, what, do you, what kind of future do you see um, in terms of actual change being made within the rule of, with the rule of law that's present, right? Um, and the second question is about opposition. Um, do you, it seems that the Cuban opposition um, is a bit fractured at the moment. Um, there isn't a clear... I would say a clear leader or a clear common goal and identity. Can you speak a little bit about um, the struggles or um, the the changes that are happening within the opposition groups? Well, there is no rule of law in Cuba. We cannot. There are some people that are talking that they want to change from the, from the law to the law. I don't understand that. If you go to the street and a couple of guys come to 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 see you and say get inside of the car, and you don't have any arrest order, you don't have anything, and you say, why? And they immediately they start to beat you. I don't, I don't understand that law. There is no law in Cuba. They do whatever they need to do in order to keep the power. This is the law in Cuba. Then, the proposition to change the situation, and you mentioned the, the electoral law, there is no election in Cuba, too. How we can talk about the election if you have the number of seats and you have the, ne the number of people that are going to be running for the seats. There is no political campaigns. There is no proposal. There is just one party. I don't understand when some people say in Cuba there are elections. I don't understand that. 
I think that for sure we won uh, at the end of this all path, we want a free election in Cuba. But, but at the same time, I think that we need to be a step by step before to go to a, an election process. And we need the freedoms and, and the rights to speak openly in the street, to go to the media, to have an independent party, to have a, a group of lawyers. We, we need several things before, at least small structure before to go to an election process. Because if no, we are going to legitimize the regime. And the regime probably is going to say, OK, I'm going to allow you four or 10 seats in the parliament. But at the end, you are going to be there for nothing. And I don't want this kind of fake change. I want a real change. And the second question related with the position. I think that this is normal to have different positions, these different visions. For example, right now, right now you have two big platforms. One that the name is the the Mesa, uh, you know, uh, la Mesa de Unidad de Acción Democrática, MUAT, something like that. And you have the forum. I belong to the forum. Our approve, approach is that one part thinks that it is possible to be inside of the reforms, they see certain reforms that the government is giving. And our position is that we need profound changes. Then, but I think that it's normal. It is normal that you have different approach to what is happening in Cuba. And they are pushing in the direction that they think or they consider that they need to do. And we are pushing in the direction that we consider that we need to do. Of course, we have contact. Probably we can build together certain demands. But I think that this is normal. The government is always trying to send a message that the opposition is fractured. They can work together. They don't obtain any result. Why, if they are done sure of that, they don't allow to us to go to the TV to have a panel of discussion? Why they don't allow to us to go to the public space if we cannot organize anything, if we are delinquents and we are mercenary and all these kind of things that they say. I told one, one, once to a, a journalist from the uh, Q1 television, I told to her, please invite me to your round table. I want to be there. I want to be discussing with the people from the government in front of the uh, Q1 au uh, audience. But they, they never do that. Because they, they know perfectly that in the moment that we can speak out, they lost the control. And that's why they are going to be always in the, in the behaving in this repressive wave. And they are, they are not going to allow us to be speaking out in any place. No space whatsoever, no, no civil society. We're going to take uh, two more questions, this gentleman. Hi, my name is Aaron Rosen from the Bank of Tokyo. Uh, I had a question regarding the dynasty building uh, issues that you mentioned earlier. So one of the main criticisms of uh, US engagement in Cuba has been that the engagement of the president has kind of legitimized and um, stabilized and solidified the rule of the Communist Party. But uh, when, when I was in Cuba in 2012, it seemed that the Communist Party was very stable in its power and um, very legitimized within the country. And so when you talked about the, let's say, the facilitation of dynasty building, I was wondering if you would link it to the engagement policy or if this was something that was happening previous to the engagement and independent of it. Muchísimas gracias por su punto de vista. Gracias. Well, in 2012, the Cuban regime was not recognized as a partner for the American government. The European Union has something that they call common position to. And the only people that have fluid relation with the regime was, uh, you know, Russia, all these uh, countries. For sure, they keep relations. But right now, you have a different dynamics. Europe is canceling the common position. They are uh, canceling the, the debt also, the economic debt with that government. And now they are pushing for more economic uh, inter interaction. 
And I think that this is creating a, a difficult scenario for us as opposition movement because they they don't want to talk with the opposition movement. I, I, we were talking uh, previously about that. And also in 2012, they didn't have the, 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 the critical situation that now they are facing, I mean in the economic area. And I, we were complaining that if the deal that is now running uh, could be uh, um, in a better framework, will be really more useful for the people. And this is our complaint. We have been telling all the time that we consider that the political process could be the, re the, the solution for our situation. But we consider also that we need a better deal. We need a real deal. And this is what I think that uh, we need right now. And I think that that's why the Cuban regime feel more comfortable, because they now uh, 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 reach that the people accept them as they are without any conditions to talk. I mean, let me just make a brief comment on that. The, I helped write the Helms-Burton legislation, which, by the way, the president can suspend, not only suspend most of the embargo, but provide assistance to a transitional government if there's a transition underway which includes a commitment to elections, not holding elections, but a commitment to elections, dismantling the police state, recognizing political freedoms or liberties, uh, freeing political prisoners, and don't jam outside broadcasting, and labor rights. The dirty little secret is Cuba is the only country in the Western Hemisphere that cannot meet any of these conditions. And so we've chucked it out the window. We just said, okay, well, the president has hotwired the, the law and just worked around these conditions. But think about what we're giving up, you know? I think it's not an unreasonable proposition that, that, that Cuba should be good at, as good at one of these things as Haiti is, or as good as, at one of these things as Venezuela is, or Bolivia, or Nicaragua. So, I mean, I really think we've sold the Cubans short, and, and uh, I don't have a guilty conscience about that because I'm, I'm opposed, I've been opposed to the, the president's strategy, mainly because I don't think he really gave due consideration to some of the consequences of legitimizing a regime that legitimized in their own, you know, in their own reality, in their own world, but not legitimate in any sense of being an elected government and, and that sort of thing. Uh, one last question, if there is one. Yeah, oh, yes, I'm sorry, Francis. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to clarify that the Eastern European countries, I've been involved in the transformation Poland, Hungary, and other Eastern European countries the last 25 years. And the Eastern European countries weren't looking to the U.S. government for leadership. They took their own initiative. And I went to many events at the uh, Czech embassy in particular. Uh, the Hungarian ambassador called me to try to engage me in Cuba in 2006. So they were very aggressive. Uh, so it's not a matter of waiting for the U.S. government to give them in, uh, direction. They understand what communism is. They understand what totalitarianism is. They understand what the conditions in Cuba were. So it's always it's important to continue to reach out to those governments. Um, uh, going, looking on and following these transformations and transitions as they occurred, um, there was a lot going on beneath the surface beforehand. And as you were talking, I'm wondering, about the information level that people have available, the Samstats, these underground newspapers, underground communications, because the vast number of the population understood that they, that they needed a change, and they were looking for the catalyst to do that. And, and that's one question I have. It, it, how much of that is going on beneath the surface? And then it's understanding that there needs to be a catalyst, because I, I look at what happened in Tunisia. When that entrepreneur burned himself, everybody said, enough's enough. And look at what happened in Poland. Look at what happened in Hungary. At the Berlin, followed the Berlin Wall. All of these things, there was always a catalyst. But you had the foundation laid beneath the surface. I think one of the things I find most disconcerting about one of the points you made is that the 
you can have, you can change the law. You can give rights to own a business and run a business and so forth. But if you, government, can, or the government, the criminal element of the government controls the inputs. So, okay, I've got a business, but in order to buy the meat for the business, I've got to go through these people, and they're going to charge me a premium, or they're not going to give me the meat. So my business goes, my restaurant goes down to tubes. That's a different issue altogether. That both have to be dealt with. And I think that's why you talk about the need for drastic change. But you can still have rule of law. You can, you can still have, I mean, you can have laws like that. Business, creating businesses. So it's kind of meaningless if you can't get inputs. And they can close you down or they can help you become successful. And, but it's parasitic. And so the government has an interest in, in keeping these things alive and creating these things and, and being a parasite and sucking off the wealth. So, you know, how do you deal with that, number one? And then, of course, what is the state of the underlying, under undersurface activity that's going on in terms of the people, human people understanding they need to change this regime? Well, that's why I was uh, talking that we need, like, um, two parallels, parallel path. We need, we need to, in one hand, to be pushing from the... Um, actions we need to to you know the activists need to be pushing uh, to the rest of the people to go to the street to protest to speak out to to demand from the regime but at the same time we are thinking how to uh, send a clear message for the people that are some of them even inside of the regime and they are knowing the elite they are in another levels and they want also uh, in some moment to to be part of the change and I think that's why uh, I was mentioning that we need to be uh, working in both past, uh, path at the same time because uh, nobody knows what can happen in some moment. And one day, people go to the street, things start to increase, the situation starts to get worse, and we need the other part. We need the other part in order to send a clear message that we are a political option for the future. Then we are completely clear that inside of the regime and just asking for certain changes. Nothing is going to change at the end. They are going to continue keeping the control over everybody. Then the idea is to move in these two paths. In one hand, to push, push, and create a, a real pressure. And in the other path, path to show our proposal, our possibility to be a, a future power or a future uh, uh, government. Then, but in this uh, situation, we need also the support from the international community because we are dealing with a, a, a kind of government that he feels totally impunity to repress us. Then I think that the, the, the change in Cuba is a combination of all of these factors. For sure, we need the change is going to, uh, is going to come from the inside, is going to come from Cubans, but we need uh, the support of the international community in order to, 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 to finish with this situation that we are facing right now in Cuba. I want to thank you very much. That was an excellent uh, set of questions from all of you and, and terrific answers, very, very impressive. Uh, and uh, I think if Cuba is in the hands of someone like you or groups like you, I think it, uh, the future looks very bright indeed. I want to thank Mark Wachtenheim for arranging uh, this encounter and, and uh, his cooperation in putting this together. Uh, I, one of the things I want to emphasize is having been ambassador to the Organization of American States and Assistant Secretary for Western Hemisphere Affairs uh, was that the really it happened in earnest when President Obama took office uh, that the Caribbean countries and Latin American countries started leaning on uh, on us over the uh, lifting the embargo and, you know, uh, as if that were the problem in Cuba. And the proposition that President Obama sold was that if we lift this embargo and if we normalize relations, that the Latin, it creates space for the Latin American and Caribbean countries to be more vocal and speak up because they're not seen as taking our lead on these things. And it, it, none of that's happened, as far as I can tell. Uh, and you've ratified that even the European and some of the Eastern European and the American government's embassy is pulling back uh, in support of, of uh, 
the legitimate representatives of the Cuban people who are not the regime, not a Stalinist regime. Uh, and, it, and that was the, you know, some of us knew that that was the case, that, the, that, the, that what was happening was the Cuban government lobbying Latins and Caribbeans to go and harass the Americans about their policy. And it's just remarkable to me that these people have, don't have the conscience uh, to care about their Cuban brothers and sisters uh, now that the U.S. has normalized relations as if, well, okay, that's settled. But you still have <laughs> settled except for 11 million people living as captives of the Castro brothers. Uh, and so, uh, you know, this is something, I, I mean, I'm very pleased that all of the people are here, uh, you know, showing uh, a level of interest, and in some cases a level of support for what uh, you're trying to do in Cuba. Uh, I think uh, the real stability will, be, will come when you have a legitimate government in Cuba uh, f freely chosen by the Cuban people. Uh, and, uh, and, and it is absolutely unfair that people have to make a decision between whether they cooperate with the regime or whether they engage the people or take care of themselves. And, it, you know, what, the only thing that matters is whether you care about that injustice or not. I think most of us care, and I think more of us should. So thank you very much, Antonio Rodriguez, and God bless, and good luck. Thank with, you. Uh, thank you all. Thanks for all you. Thank you.